Welcome to Uplook's Summer Bible Program. We're studying 16 key salvation terms. Today's lesson, the practical results of being saved. Assurance. One of the wonderful truths linked with the gospel is the subject of assurance. Many religions purport to tell us what lies ahead, but they always couch their statements with hope so, maybe. No one's really sure if their works will merit an entrance into heaven or if God will accept them. But no such fear is associated with the message of the gospel of the grace of God. These things are written that you might know that you have eternal life. He that has the Son has life and shall not come into judgment, but is already passed from death into life. Assurance is one of the great ringing messages of the gospel preacher. In 1 Thessalonians 1.5, the apostle says, Our gospel came not to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it works every time. It's the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. There are three aspects to this assurance given to us in the Word of God. We have the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. The full assurance of understanding. We're not left in the dark. This is the only book that takes us by the hand and shows us God creating the universe, God making man, God coming and speaking with man and longing for fellowship with man. It shows all the twists and turns, warts and all, of the people of faith, their failures, their weaknesses, their drawbacks, and God sovereign overruling and bringing about his purposes. But he doesn't leave us in the dark. The Lord Jesus said to his disciples, I haven't called you slaves, I've called you friends. Friends know what the master's doing. I've let you in on divine secrets. Paul says to the Ephesians that we have become confidants of heaven. He's made known to us the mystery of his will. And so we're not in the dark. We have the full assurance of understanding. He's told us how the story ends. They live happily ever after. It's not a fairy tale. It's really going to happen. From start to finish, the whole story has been laid out for us to know. The full assurance of understanding. And then secondly, we read about the full assurance of hope in Hebrews 6.11. The full assurance of hope. And it's so interesting to me in Hebrews chapter 6, the whole issue is how we can be sure. More people fear and tremble at Hebrews 6 than any other passage in the Bible. And yet if it's rightly understood, Hebrews 6 is a ringing affirmation that God doesn't give up on his people. When God made a promise, he didn't have to seal it with an oath. If God says something, you take him at his word. But because God wanted us to be so sure, God swore an oath. Now, there's a problem because we always swear by the greater. That's why men put their hands on the Bible and swear in the presence of God. But there's no one greater than God. And so we read God swore by himself. He put his own character down as collateral to guarantee the promise he was making. And not only that, says the writer to the Hebrews, but he gave us an anchor for our souls, sure and steadfast inside the veil. In other words, I'm so sure of being in heaven because my life is already there. Christ is our life. Our life is hidden with Christ in God. My life is already in heaven. <laughs> and so I can be absolutely sure of being there because my life is already there. And then he says, not only so, but Christ has entered as our forerunner. He doesn't just want us to be sure of heaven. He wants us to know how we'll be received when we get there. Do you think that when you get to heaven, God will say, well, I guess I'll let you in. You're not a very good example of a Christian, but 
just don't be too obvious, you know, I, I suppose I should. Is that how he'll receive us? No, he will receive us the way our forerunner was received. When Christ went to heaven, he didn't go there for himself. He appears in heaven for you. And God got up off his throne and said, Son, sit here with me on my throne until I make your enemies your footstool. This is how we will be received in heaven. The Lord Jesus will rise from the throne and he himself will come to greet us. And he will say, Father, I and the children whom thou hast given me. He will joy over us with singing. We have a full assurance of hope that when we at last step on shore heaven, we'll be home and we'll be welcomed. And then thirdly, we have the full assurance of faith. This is linked to the doctrine of eternal security. What is our faith? Is faith in ourselves, in our performance, in our good works? No, our faith is in God. And that means that because God is unchangeable, God cannot lie, he cannot change, he cannot deny himself, even when we stumble in our hearts. When Peter denied the Lord Jesus, did the Lord Jesus deny Peter? No. Why, in fact, they all forsook him and fled. And when the Lord Jesus spoke to Mary Magdalene after the resurrection, he said, don't detain me, but go and tell my brothers. <laughs> the last we heard of them, they'd all forsaken him and fled. And now he says, go tell my brothers. In the words of David Brown in the famous Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown commentary, he says, there is nothing we can do to unbrother ourselves. Safe in his hand, secure, says the Lord Jesus. I don't lose my sheep. And my hand and my father's hand are linked together in this grand purpose to make sure they all get home safely. You put your trust in Christ. He will not let you go. The full assurance of understanding, the full assurance of hope, and the full assurance of faith. There are people who struggle with assurance. And I want to tell you that sometimes the reason we struggle with assurance is just because we're not depending on what God says. We need to look at these verses again. They're there in black and white, and we need to ask ourselves this question, does God lie? If he says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved, and I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, can I take the first half and not the second half of that sentence and say, well, I don't know if I will be saved? Sometimes it's just not resting in the word of God. Sometimes it's because I'm looking at myself. There are people who looked to Christ and the cross to save them, but then they look to themselves for assurance. I can no more assure myself than I can save myself. John writes, we shall assure ourselves before him. The Lord can give us that assurance. His spirit can witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And so we lay hold of this truth. We believe what God has said. Don't look at yourself. What Christ did on the cross makes us safe. What God says in his word makes us sure. But now sometimes people wobble in their assurance because they're living careless lives. And the Spirit of God is convicting them to get right with the Lord, and they don't know if they're saved. Look, if you haven't had a garbage collection in a long time, and you're carrying this heavy load of unconfessed sin, you wonder if you're saved. There's no joy, there's no purpose, there's no hope in your heart. Well, you know what to do. <laughs> Spend some time with the Lord. Get honest with him. And you say, well, I can't remember all those sins. Well, the Holy Spirit has a really good memory. He'll help you. You committed them one at a time. You better confess them one at a time. And just say, Lord, I'm going to be honest with you. you. You bring it before me and I'll confess it. That means to say the same thing about something, to acknowledge it. And if you do, you'll find that your peace is restored and your assurance is restored because you're being saved from your sin, from the power of your sin, just as you've been saved from its penalty. So let me encourage you and to think of these beautiful words. If I could only tell him as I know him, 
my Redeemer who has brightened all my way. If I could tell how precious is his presence, I am sure that you would make him yours today. God's salvation is full. It is complete. He's thought of everything. There's not a weak link in the chain. We can trust him. We can have full assurance based on his promises, based on his character, and based on the work of the Holy Spirit within us. And we can say, he has done all things well. I can trust God all the way home. May God encourage you and bless you in this as we walk in the full assurance of our salvation in Christ. Welcome to the last video in our series of Gospel Words through the summer. Uh, we're on the topic of assurance. Make sure to like the video, uh, to leave some comments. We're collecting those questions uh, for another Q&A after this series. And uh, make sure to subscribe and to share uh, with others uh, so that they can get in on this series as well. Uh, our first question on the topic of assurance has to do with uh, several verses that uh, are commonly used to say that Christians can lose their salvation. So I was wondering if you could comment on some of these. Uh, we've got Matthew 24, 13, uh, which talks about in those who endure to the end will be saved. We've got John 15, 6, the parable with that vine and how the branches that don't bear fruit are going to be removed from the vine. Um, Hebrews 6, uh, 4 through 6, uh, where it's impossible for those who fall away to renew again to repentance. And then finally, uh, in Hebrews 10, where those who sin willfully, uh, there's no sacrifice for sins anymore, but instead a fearful looking of judgment. So, uh, if you have some thoughts, it's <laughs> quite the load of verses. All right, thanks, Dave. Uh, that is uh, quite a mouthful, isn't it? Uh, one of the important things we've been trying to stress in this whole series is that when you're looking at words and looking at ideas, make sure you see them in the context. Because actually you can prove anything you want from the Bible, including there is no God. It happens to be quoting a fool at the time. But uh, when people say, well, you could make anything out of the Bible, you can only do that if you're not following the rules of interpretation. The Bible is not plastic. You can't make it mean anything you want it to mean. So when we turn to Matthew chapter 24, uh, we have to ask an important question. When the Lord Jesus is speaking to these men, uh, we call the disciples, uh, who exactly are they? Sometimes the answer is, these men represent the nation of Israel. They're going to sit on 12 thrones, uh, ruling over the 12 tribes in a coming day. And of course they were all Jews and they had Jewish roots, Jewish heritage. So sometimes the Lord Jesus spoke to them as representative Israel. There were other times because they were the apostles of the church, the foundation stones on which the church was going to be built. Sometimes he speaks to them as he's speaking to uh, the church. So when we read a passage like that, we're going to look for the clues as to what these men are representing at a given time. And when we read, for example, in Matthew 24, he who endures to the end shall be saved. And then just a verse or two later, we read, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place and so on, and we read that the Lord warns them, make sure that their flight is not on the Sabbath day. That means nothing to me as a Gentile believer, but to a practicing Orthodox Jew, they will not travel more than a Sabbath day's journey. And, and so he's actually warning the Jewish remnant during the tribulation period. So he that endures to the end shall be saved is actually referring to a Jew who believes in God, who is looking for Israel's Messiah, 
and who will receive Israel's Messiah when the Lord Jesus returns. They'll look on him whom they pierced and they will believe in him. That's the day when we read all Israel will be saved. So taking this verse applying to Christians today is completely out of context. Over in John 15, now I have a series of uh, articles on our Uplook website that deal with these transition passages in John. Uh, John is not so much a historical biography as Matthew, Mark, and Luke are. He's focusing on certain important details and explaining this transition from the Lord Jesus going to the house of Israel to him becoming the savior of the whole world. And so here in chapter 15, we have to ask this important question. When did Jesus become the true vine? Did he become the true vine at his incarnation? And I don't think that's the right answer. I think he always was the true vine. In other words, when we read the Messianic Psalms, who was David growing on when he was producing these delicious bunches of grapes that we call the Messianic Psalms? Who was Abraham growing on when, as Jesus said, he rejoiced to see my day and was glad? Well, the hope of the Messiah was a real and living uh, hope in the hearts of the Jewish people in the past generation. So uh, the Jews had the concept that they were going to cut Jesus off. And he's explaining, no, that's not what's going to happen. There are people who are in association with me in Judaism who do not share my life. They don't have the life of God in them because they've rejected my message. And as such, those people are the ones who are going to be cut off. There's no evidence of life in them and there's no fruit that's been produced. In fact, as he said to many of these Jewish people, you're of your father the devil, you do his works. And so it was not the fruit of the spirit that was being produced in them because they had not received Christ and therefore did not abide in him. So this is referring to people who were in him in the sense that they were associated with him through the nation of Israel, but they were not the spiritual children of Abraham because they did not have the faith of Abraham. And so I think that's how we understand that section in John 15. Now when we come over to uh, the Hebrews passages, again, there are a series of detailed articles on the Uplook website that deal with the warning passages in Hebrews. And these warning passages, we have to understand, are the writer to the Hebrews explaining the fatal flaws in Judaism. Now, Judaism was ideal for its original design, but it was not intended to be the way of salvation. It was not by the blood of bulls and goats that sin could be taken away. And so the Jewish people who were clinging to their Judaism and saying, why should we give up Judaism, which is a God-given religion, and embrace Jesus, we could end up losing our families, uh, our jobs, maybe our lives. Why can't we just stick with Judaism? And so the writer to the Hebrews is going to explain to them then certain fatal flaws, things that were missing in Judaism that are essential for our salvation. In chapter 6, he's dealing with this issue of assurance. There was no assurance in Judaism because it was a continual sacrifice, series of sacrifices, and there was never that point where I could say sin has been dealt with permanently. Likewise, in chapter 10, he's dealing with a very specific thing. He says here, if we sin willfully. Now, in Judaism, there was no sacrifice for willful sin. There were sacrifices for sins of ignorance. But if you sinned willfully, then there was nothing but looking forward to of judgment. So the writer to the Hebrew says, if you go back to Judaism, then there's no sacrifice for willful sin. Now in Christ, we read he died to save us from all iniquity. And the word iniquity is self-willed sin. And so Christ has covered it all. But Judaism doesn't have a sacrifice for willful sin. So again, we read these verses in their context and pretty soon it becomes obvious that the overwhelming message of the New Testament, which says if you have the Son, you have life, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you are saved, that eternal life means exactly that. These verses are not contradicted by 
these few passages that cause Christians trouble. And I think if we look carefully at the context, we'll see that they mesh perfectly with the other scriptures that teach assurance and eternal security. In the last line of your response, you uh, mentioned two different phrases, uh, eternal security and assurance. What is the difference and the relationship between these two ideas? All right, that is really helpful to understand. Let's give a short definition first of all. Eternal security means that I can never lose my salvation. Assurance means that I know that I have salvation. So when John writes in his gospel, he tells us the reason for the book. And he says in John chapter 20 in verse 30, truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So this has to do with the idea of knowing how to be saved. When we go over to 1 John and uh, chapter 5, he explains to us here that in chapter 5 and verse 13, these things have I written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Now you'll notice that in both cases it has to do with the written word. These things are written that you may believe, and these things are written that you may know that you believe. So the basis of my salvation, believing what God says, is the same basis of my certainty believing that what he says is true. When we come to the subject of eternal security, there are many people who struggle because they think that salvation is a commodity, eternal life is something, and they might lose it. Whereas the Bible teaches that eternal life is in a person. Uh, this life is in his son. He that has the son has life. This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. So when we understand that our life is actually hidden with Christ in God, that I don't have life independent of Jesus. God didn't give me a piece of life what he did was he gave me his son. And the only way my eternal life could be lost is if God loses Christ, because that's the secret of my eternal life. It's not me hanging on for dear life. It's the idea that he has secured me. He has saved me. So there are people who struggle with the issue of eternal security because they don't understand that salvation is of the Lord. On the other hand, there are those at the other end of the spectrum who are absolutely sure that if they're saved, they can't lose it. They struggle in whether they have it. Because again, they think this is something God does entirely, and how will I know if I'm saved? I have to keep looking at myself to see evidence in my life. Whereas John says, no, don't look to yourself for the evidence, look to the Word. And so in both cases, whether it's believing so that I might have eternal life, or understanding, having assurance that I'll never lose that life, it's based on what God says in his word. And so this is the root problem, people looking to themselves for assurance when they should be looking to what God says in his word. So both of these ideas are important. Uh, eternal security that I can't lose it, assurance that I do have it. And in both cases, looking into the Word of God, believing what God says, he that has the Son has life. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. 
And the Lord Jesus says in John 10, I give to my sheep eternal life, they shall never perish. There's no escape clause, no fine print there. He's guaranteed it. If I don't get to heaven, after I put my trust in Christ, Jesus will have to leave because he's a liar. But he says, I'm not going to lose any of my sheep. And I'm committed to this. You're in my hand. My hand is in my Father's hand. And you can count on us to get you all safely home. You mentioned in your overview that someone that doesn't feel assured may be living an ungodly lifestyle. Can't this doctrine lead to careless Christianity? Yes, there are people who use that as an argument. I think uh, we're not going to build arguments on presuppositions. We want to build it on what the scripture says. Now, the assumption is that a person who belongs to Christ can live carelessly and get away with it, but we don't get away with it. And the writer to the Hebrews explains, if you belong to the Lord and you're living habitually in sin, he's going to spank you. And if he doesn't spank you, then you may be an illegitimate child because my father spanks me. I would say to my father, why can't I do such a thing? Johnny's dad's letting him do it. And he'd say, well, yeah, I'm not Johnny's dad right? So we don't spank other people's children, I hope, when we go to the Walmart. Uh, parents are responsible for their own children, and God says, I chasten my children. So the idea that we can sin with impunity and get away with it is just not true. Now, Psalm 51, David's penitential psalm, is a clear example of this, where it seemed he was getting away with it for a fairly long period of time. But he gives his confession here in chapter 51 and says that his bones were aching and he lost his joy and he lost his song and he was in distress and he felt dirty and so on. He may have given on the outward appearance uh, that he had it all together, but he was in agony of soul. We're reminded of the children of Israel in the wilderness and they're not in the promised land enjoying the milk and honey. They're not in... Egypt enjoying the leeks and onions and garlic, they're stuck in the desert, wandering around waiting to die. It's a very sad position to be in. I think it was Martin Luther who said, many Christians envy the sinners their pleasure and their saints their joy because they don't have either one. Uh, and so the fact is that the most miserable person in the world is the Christian who's out of fellowship with God because they can't really enjoy the world. They have a new nature now that's offended by the world. And at the same time, uh, they're not enjoying the blessings of living in close fellowship with the Lord. So when David writes this and says, not restore to me my salvation, but restore to me the joy of thy salvation. Now the devil knows he can't steal our salvation, but if he can steal away the joy, he's neutralized us. Uh, we need to have that joy as strength, as a witness to the reality of our faith. So when we lose that joy, uh, we become miserable, we become pushovers uh, for the devil. The devil tries to neutralize our confidence in God uh, to undermine our dependence on the authority of Scripture. And all we need to do is come back to the Word of God and say, wait a minute, what does God say? The devil's a liar, I take God's Word for what he says. And the moment I do, I have assurance, not based on my feelings, not based on my performance, but based on the unchanging Word of God. Well, now that we've come to the end of this series on Salvation Words, we have one final video which will be a Q&A on the questions that you actually have sent in. We've got some really good questions, so I know you look forward to that. But apart from that, you might want to send us some comments on 
topics you'd like covered from the Word of God. Now that we finished this series, we're eager to do some others. And so you let us know some of the areas of Scripture that you would like some uh, commentary on, some discussion of, and we'd be happy to look into it. So thanks for watching, and we hope you're blessed. And if you enjoy it, share it with others and spread the blessing around. Thanks very much.